Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of MECFS Alert, coming to you today from New York City, where I am lucky to have as my guest Susan Levine, who has been in practice here for many years and may have the largest cohort of patients in the city. Very well respected, very well liked. We're so glad you've joined this broadcast, which I founded with my friend Deborah Waroff, who, alas, is also a patient. Dr. Levine, thank you for joining us on this broadcast. Uh, how did you get to be exclusively concerned with ME? We'll use ME as the, as sure. the, uh, yeah. the way of saying uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis. Okay. I can spell it now. I didn't you learn spell to spell it. it easily, but it came to me. Good. Well, uh, I get that question a lot because it's, it's kind of an unusual specialty. I kind of fell into it by accident. I was finishing my fellowship at Mount Sinai and really didn't know what I was going to do with my medical career. Um, it was at the brink of AIDS and having uh, identified the HIV virus. But there was always a group of patients in the infectious disease clinic who presented with fatigue and they were kind of cast aside and people paid attention to the more deadly disease, the uh, AIDS at the time. And so I just took this cohort on and flew with it. I opened a small office expecting to just have part-time. And then within a year, I had a full practice of uh, CFS patients or EBV syndrome patients as we called it back then. How did you... Uh how did you decide to stay with it? I mean, being uh, really a, a backwater of medicine at that time, yes. hardly central, did you fi feel this was a sort of resignation in your career or an exciting dimension? Well, actually, I find it, and I still to this day find it quite exciting. To me, as sad as it is and disappointing in terms of the, the type of funding that we get, um, I found it always very exciting uh, in the sense that when I was working at my fellowship, I was working with a lady named Charlotte Cunningham Rundles, who's a physician that co-authored the first paper on this disease in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And she would see patients, but then she wouldn't know what to do with them. And so I kind of got the patients that she discarded, so to speak. Well, she and was not the only doctor that doesn't know what to do with patients. That's for sure. There are states where there is no doctor who is specialized. And right. I get a lot of telephone calls or more often emails from patients who want a doctor, which I'm unable to help them with. I try to direct them to somebody who might know. Absolutely. Why do we get so little talent into this field? I think doctors are frustrated by the lack of a biomarker or a more concrete, objective way of both diagnosing and treating this illness. Because in this day and age with the technology that we have available, um, diabetes, coronary artery disease are easy to you know, zero in on and treat, so to speak. But this illness has a sort of a vaguer quality as other people view it. I, I feel comfortable, I, I can diagnose usually within about five or 10 minutes of seeing the patient. Really um, that fast? Well, um, I think some of, you know, having seen many patients with this and many of them arrive with two telephone books full of records and I ask them the key, do you have post-exertional malaise, unrefreshing sleep or autonomic dysfunction? Sometimes their body habitus, especially the uh, adolescents who come with this, uh, is very telling. You can tell when they have hyperextension in their extremities, and um, some of them will have blue feet as they walk in the door from the uh, POTS symptoms, and um, you know, you can just... Blue feet, would you enlarge on that? It's not a term I have heard. Right. Well, with uh, orthostatic intolerance and I actually find this interesting, even though I'm an adult physician, some of the younger folks that I'm starting to see in my practice present initially with more pronounced autonomic dysfunction symptoms. And what that means is things like orthostatic intolerance, where they faint if they stand too long or have heart palpitations and sweat easily. And what happens is they get something called venous pooling in their lower extremities mm -hmm. and their feet may not get adequately not enough blood flow to their feet. And so they literally turn blue or red and they mm. wear compression hose to rein that in. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So that 
autonomic dysfunction aspect of the illness is, is very interesting. I know you do some work with Dr. Ian Lippman at the Mailman Institute at Columbia University. Right. He has said that within two years he believes he can deploy a biomarker regime where doctors can fairly quickly establish the presence of right. this disease. Uh, have you worked on that and is that like on track? Right. I, you know, uh, I've worked with Ian and several other clinicians around the country as part of a multi-site center of excellence for which we just got funded. And frankly, at this point, we're just collecting specimens from patients. There's a ton of, pa of samples in the freezer uh, that are waiting to be analyzed, but we haven't gotten enough funding to analyze those. I am not so hopeful. Uh, I hope Ian doesn't get angry when I say this, um, that we will find one marker. I think rather there will be subgroups of ME-CFS patients within what I call an umbrella of ME-CFS, and each of them may well have distinct biomarkers, but I doubt that there will be one biomarker. Do you think that this is a disease like cancer? which is many diseases, they're not being one cancer. Yeah. Do you think that this is in fact a collaboration of diseases in the body? I really do. I think all the patients share these fundamental traits with the post-exertional malaise and the other things I mentioned earlier, the clinical distinguishing characteristics. But each of them have their own sort of um, costume, so to speak. For instance, the autonomic dysfunction, or um, mast cell disorder or fibromyalgia and I think each of those comorbidities or other conditions that they have in addition to CFS distinguishes them and may well uh, influence the natural history of that group's disease. So I think it is a heterogeneous disorder with some common features like cancer. Uh, can we uh, can we do something to boost the interest of medical schools in getting this onto the curriculum? Yeah, yeah. this is a, a big interest of mine because a lot of us are are getting close to retirement. Although I, I still have a good ten years in me, I think at least. Uh, I think bolstered by the idea that we've gotten poultry as it is some NIH funding, the idea that I can be a clinician researcher. Uh, or that other doctors who are considering going into this field or medical professionals can do both. They can do, so look at it as kind of a, a mystery to solve or a puzzle to solve and also that you can treat patients. So I think if you can wear two hats, I, I, I find this, it invigorates my interest in it if I can do both things. At and the same you can time. keep close to patients. Right. Um, how do you tell a patient, I'm afraid you have this disease and there's no cure? Do you tell them about various things that may ameliorate the symptoms? And there's a great range of things that I've interviewed people who get comfort from sucking a lozenge or psilius right. sounds um, to, to people who take a whole set of antiviral drugs right. or people who are on Amplogen, which works for some. That's and right. other, other things that work for some, not as a cure, but some relief. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you have a table of these that you right. sort of go through one after the other to see what works here? Yeah, no, that, that is a good question. And over the years, I've kind of developed a strategy, some of it modified, but some of the new research findings. For instance, we find that patients who present with sort of an acute onset, that is they get sick over a period of 24 to 48 hours, more than likely have an infectious etiology or cause. And These I, are the people who can remember the exact minute, which is one of the phenomena absolutely. of this disease. Yes, yes. And those folks who also are within a sort of kind of an arbitrary time frame, a, th a three year period, those people I will start if they haven't already been started on an antiviral. Oftentimes Valtrex, sometimes Valgancyclovir, these are two anti-herpes drugs. The issue with the latter is that it's, um, we don't know what the long-term side effects are and I have some concern about that. Although I know that other practitioners like Dr. Montoya will prescribe it and just monitor the patient carefully. That's Dr. Montoya from Stanford. Right, right. Tell me about mast cells. Okay, okay. 
mast, mast cells are very interesting and um, I, we're finding that, see I, I'm looking at, and I think a lot of us who've been in the field for a while are looking at MECFS as many phases. The initial viral phase, so to speak, and then a, a pro-inflammatory phase that ensues because the immune system is overzealous and produces these things called pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now mast cells are aligned, are also inflammatory cells. And we're used to thinking of them as producing histamine uh, in uh, allergy patients. But many of the patients, again, this adolescent group seems to be more prominent in having mast cell disorder, have hives. But you have to ask, you have to elicit that answer. They won't volunteer that, oh, I get hives. You have to ask them, oh, do you ever get hives? And they look at me like startled. How did you know? And so uh, hives, um, dermatographism, like if they wear something tight, the clothing will make a mark. Um, some of them have had eczema. And see, it's very interesting. There's some articles, um, published articles, that indicate that mast cells are also in the brain, and they are situated near the pain centers in the brain. So we think there's this dual interaction between mast cells and pain receptor cells in the central nervous system. So I find this absolutely fascinating. So by reducing the mast cell activity, we can also influence pain and other pro-inflammatory cytokine effects. And how do you do that with, with antihistamines? Right, we use some older antihistamines like chromalin, for instance, that was used in children. That are not prescribed generally nowadays. Right, but still available. And we even use Zantac, which as you know is for the stomach, but it has anti-H1 properties as well. So there's a bunch of them. Part of this is an aside, and you probably know about this, but um, Cindy Bateman, who's one of the site people I coordinate with, with Lipkin, um, uh, had us over for a, a Utah summit. And I thought this was fantastic. She got all of us clinicians together in Utah, and it's on her website, and we all sat around and shared our treatment strategies. So at this roundtable discussion, which took place about five or six months ago, and it's available on, on YouTube. And let's, was, uh, let's just repeat her name. Uh, it's Dr. Bateman, who Dr. most Bateman, people have heard of. Most people have heard of. And she also is very interested in educating, especially clinicians, to sort of carry on the tradition of at least what we have, what we know about. Anyway, at that roundtable, there was uh, a lot of discussion about this mast cell because it was something that we could do for the patient. And you know, there's about a handful of different treat treatment strategies for this. And so we, we made a list of our five favorite treatments. How is it there was this long desert in treatment between the outbreak, the mass outbreak in London in 1955 at the Royal Free Hospital uh, and in Klein Village in 1984. That's a long period of people in the medical wilderness. That's right. And that they didn't quite come out of the medical wilderness because of 1984-85, but there was some movement. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, what happened to all those it's, people? It's, it's very hard to believe, but I feel that even though we all know each other well, Cindy Bateman, Dan Peterson, Tony Komarov, we see each other at meetings, we give each other a hug, but none of us really pick up the phone and talk to each other about treatments. So Cindy Bateman was quite revolutionary, and you'd think that this would have happened sooner, to get us all together, and we're continuing this, by the way, virtually, because it's hard for us well, to get to one place. You, you touched on something very important, which is the stove piping in every profession, yeah. and it's clear it's in this. The other thing which I found very interesting that you just said, which is using an older type of, inter, um, of, of, of antihistamine, right. uh, because there are so many drugs out there that have been invented for other purposes exactly right. that might do a wonderful job. Do we have, in this age of mass data, a way of looking at the inventory of drugs and saying, hey, that one didn't work so well for this, but boy, it might work fabulously for that. That's exactly right. And one other uh, person that you mentioned that you interviewed recently, Dr. Sistrom over at uh, Brigham and David Women. Sistrom, yes. He's repurposing um, Mestinon, which is a drug that was developed for myasthenia gravis 
as a way of improving preload in these patients who he's discovered have too little filling pressure in their hearts, um, you know, with the MECFS. So I think that's going to be the way to go. We're going to repurpose existing drugs and, and use those, their side effects to treat ME patients because to get a new drug like Amplogen, for instance, through the FDA pipeline is ridiculously Well, long. Amplogen has had a particularly trouble. I was going to ask you about Amplogen because it's this sort of hoary old question of these right. interviews. Right. What about Amplogen? There are people I have interviewed and talked to and people call me and talk to me uh, who swear by it, who have yeah. had great relief. Yeah. Um, and some, one woman in particular who you know, but I wouldn't mention her name, said she cannot walk without it. Yeah. Yes. and she's basically moved across country to be able to get it. That's exactly uh, yeah. Why is it so difficult to get that through? There's a very long history of success with it in some patients, not for all patients, but in some patients. Uh, wouldn't you think there was some accelerated route that it could be you would think, uh, yeah. made available to people who are positively helped by it? Right, right. No, I completely agree, and I, and I think the FDA has certainly held it up, uh, largely, so they say, for safety issues. And I think there was also a, uh, um, a s problem with the supply of it. Um, I have had some patients way back try it in an open label setting, but part of it is the cost is prohibitive, obviously, since it's not FDA approved. And I, one of the patients didn't do that well with it, so I had some trouble with it. Um, I think if we, ha this leads me to another point, I think if we had a hospital-based clinic where you're in a hospital setting, you have uh, ways of treating people who have adverse side effects like anaphylaxis, for instance, with some of these newer drugs, uh, we were talking about uh, until we're not, now we're not so sure it's that helpful, Rituxan is another one um, that was tried in Norway. This is a the Norwegians were extremely bullish on Rituxan. Exactly, exactly. We had some reservations about, see the double-edged sword of MECFS patients is that you need something really strong to treat them because whatever it is, it's affected their whole body, their central nervous system, everything. However, many have side effects to even the slightest, what we consider the least toxic drug. So you have to proceed extremely cautiously. And in my view, just having had the experience, I would like to carry out a lot of these trials and even something like Amplogen were it to be available in a hospital setting, at least for the initial dose. And looking around your, your offices here on 72nd Street in New York, there are a lot of IVs, uh, right. which suggests you're providing some intravenous drugs. Right. Well, some, in, some infusions? In, we do saline infusions, uh, which we find extremely helpful for POTS patients, patients who have problems, uh, many of the viewers know what I'm uh, alluding to, uh, where the, the heart is racing because the blood volume is too low. And so the IV saline improves the blood volume, slows down the heart, and allows it to pump more efficiently. So that's one of the things we infuse. We also infuse magnesium because that helps with pain in the fibro patients. And, um, you know, uh, I do have some patients on gamma globulin. I generally don't do that in the office. That is done through a home nursing service. Um, and the, and the patients will get that monthly if they have an immune deficiency. And you've, you've, raised, you've raised the subject of, of how patients can help each other uh, and how physicians can help each other. Right. Uh, do we need more collectives? Do we need more patient groups talking to each other, um, sharing information? I, I put out a call once for things that help you and I got more than 200 responses. I couldn't, I actually, I think we ended up over 400. I couldn't respond to all of them. Right. And some of them were extremely simple, like my cat is a yeah. great comfort, yes. my dog. Uh, but these were real things. And uh, one very severely afflicted young woman who used uh, Eastern oils, yeah. which she believed helped her. 
uh, and maybe it was psychosomatic, maybe it was real, but it helped her, so it was real. If it helps you, it is real. That's it is, right. it is, yeah. it is. Um, how can we gather all of these things together and how can people share them with each other? Right, right. No, I think that's extremely important. Well, certainly, as you know, there are Facebook groups. Uh, that's one way of sharing. There's also another group which you probably heard of called Millions Missing. Yes. Which was sort of instigated or at least kind of given a boost by uh, Unrest, the movie Unrest. Yeah, right. I think it existed prior to the movie, but... But, um, but the, the movie, Jennifer yeah. Bray's movie, was very important. Yes, and I think it's a very powerful movement. Uh, there's, there are advocates in many different cities around the, the world that are, um, you know, uh, bringing people together through this social media outlet. Um, also, Lyndon Tannenbaum's Open Medicine, you know, bringing together people. I think, you know, that's certainly, social media provides a great network for people to talk and share treatments. You know, I've often uh, thought that it must have been so much worse for patients before social media. Yes. One of the, the joys of social media, if you can use that word, which may be too strong, but is that you're not alone. Yes. Uh, and patients with this disease are very alone. Uh, and anything that makes them less alone, that tackles the loneliness, and I've done some long co interviews, conversations really, on the subject of loneliness, right. when you can't go to events, right. when you can't go out with your friends, and gradually your friends tend to um, disappear or disappear. drift away, right. drift away. I mean, you can't absolutely blame them. Um, so this is very interesting. Do you feel, you said maybe you have another 10 years in practice, I suspect you have 15, but if that doesn't daunt you too much. Yeah. Um, do you feel that in that time we'll, we, will, we will get a cure or a therapy sufficient that it ameliorates enough of the symptoms for these people to rejoin, for the patients to rejoin the human race? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm certainly help, hopeful that that is the case. Um, I'd love to get more practitioners into the field, not just physicians, but, you know, nurse practitioners, PAs, occupational therapists, those people. I'd love to get it more introduced into the medical curriculum. Um, I feel, and I alluded to this before our interview, um, that there's a lot of really interesting high-level work going on at these institutions, like at the Mailman School of Public Health and um, Maureen Hansen at Cornell, but I feel like it hasn't been brought to the clinician's office that we can yet offer the patient an actual treatment. I think it hasn't drifted down into our hands where we are in the trenches. Me to, medicine is quite conservative in some ways. Yeah, yeah. In that clinicians do what they have done and what they were taught to do. Right, right. So it's going to change, take a while to change people, but I'm hopeful. I really, you know, I feel like this is an exciting time to be in. Certainly in the last five years, there's been a great sense of a quickening of the pace. Would you agree with that? Definitely, for sure. There's a much more of a sense of things are happening, things are being tried, stones are being turned over, that kind of... I must say I'm a little disappointed uh, with the disbanding of the Federal Advisory Committee. Well, this is a very serious issue. Um, yeah. Why was that disbanded? I thought it was a splendid way of the government to cure the people and yeah. for the people to petition the government. Yeah. Well, I, to be honest, I think a lot of folks, including myself, felt that they weren't being heard. But nonetheless, because a lot of what we talked about so ferociously during these meetings, like no one bothered to respond. A lot of these officials from the different eight state agencies and uh, federal agencies never really responded to our requests. On the other hand, it provided a forum for all of us to get together and, and feel as if we could do something. Um, I think it's disappointing. I, the charter wasn't renewed. I'm not quite sure why. I'm certainly going to try to fight it uh, because I think we need forums like this to get our voices heard. And uh, how long did, did it go before it was disbanded? Um, probably, I could be wrong, I think it's been at least 20 years. I, would, I, I think I first went to a meeting like seven years ago, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And I thought it was a splendid way for the government 
you know, if that is happening, even if the government doesn't want to hear it, it will hear. Yes. But if it's not happening, right. there's no way it can hear. Yeah, there's yeah. no way that that information, that enthusiasm, and sometimes a lot of people were able to convey the extent of the suffering to the government. If the meetings are not happening, the suffering hasn't gone away, the need hasn't gone away. Yeah. Doctor, it's a great pleasure to meet you. It's a thank great you. pleasure for you to be on this broadcast. And thank you so much, I can say that on behalf of all the people who write to me, for your diligence and your endless efforts on their behalf. Okay, thank Cheers. you. Cheers. That's nice of it.